Hello, my name is Hain. I am a junior doctor working at NUH. In this video, I am going to be talking about nausea and vomiting. Focus me largely on how to reach the diagnosis by using the clinical clues. Please note, this is not the exhaustive list of all the conditions that can present with nausea and vomiting, but rather some of the most common and aligned problems that we tend to come across in clinical practice. Anywhere along the presentation, feel free to pause and take a moment to go through the slide and reflect on the learning materials. First, we will categorize the potential problems into two major groups. In this slide, you can see intra-abdominal etiologies. Then we come to other systems in miscellaneous causes. For the next few slides, we are going to take an analytical approach using associated symptoms as clues. Vomiting in itself is a very vague symptom in terms of being able to use it to identify the problem. But if you do thorough clinical assessment by going through all the cardinal signs and symptoms of all the systems, you should be able to reach the diagnosis. One of the most common symptoms is abdominal pain. It is important to take the thorough history for the nature of pain as it will help us narrow down our differentials. Another notable symptom is change in bowel habit. Chest pain is one of the symptoms that is suggestive of potential serious etiologies, such as myocardial inversion. Probing into the characteristics of pain will guide us whether this could be related to cardiac pathologies or pulmonary causes. Sometimes nausea and vomiting can be part of the syndromic features of neurological problems. Some of them can be serious causes like stroke, sinus infection, brain tumor, less sinister issues such as migraines and idiopathic intracranial hypertension can also be responsible. A lot of metabolic disturbances can be associated with nausea and vomiting. Diabetic ketoacidosis as a differential should be considered in someone with known type 1 diabetes. Urinary tract infections and kidney stones can also present with nausea and vomiting. Again, asking about pain in detail should give us some pointers. For example, the classic loin to grind pain of uteric stones. Menstrual symptoms should be explored in women, especially those of reproductive age.
eating disorders and also present with vomiting. In clinical assessment, you will often see they tend to have chronic repeated episodes of vomiting, and you can also find features of nutritional deficiency. A lot of medications can cause GI upset, either in their therapeutic or toxic concentration. In cases of food poisoning, there is usually history of consumption of unhygienic or undercooked food, and family or friends sharing the same symptoms. Sepsis is also an important differential, especially in those who are rapidly deteriorating. Here are some of the miscellaneous causes. Cyclic vomiting syndrome and gastroparesis are usually diagnoses of exclusion. That should be considered only after confidently ruling out other more sinister or potentially treatable problems. We have to analyze formatus as well. Is it food, acid, bile, blood, or fecal matter? It often correlates with the anatomy and function of our digestive tract, and hence, it's a good indicator as to where the problem might be. And of course, we should also be able to identify reflex in a timely manner. Signs and symptoms suggestive of aboriginal bleeding, acute surgical abdomen, significant cardiac or intracranial pathologies should be recognized as soon as possible. People with immunosuppression are vulnerable to uncommon infections and serious implications can often result. We should also pay attention to the adverse outcomes related to vomiting, such as dehydration, shock, and electrolyte imbalance, and the direct effects of the underlying etiology as well. Often we can appreciate those changes by observing early warning scores, metastasis, and a urine output. This is an overview of hemptomesis, covering some of the common underlying problems and red flags. The intended learning outcomes for you here is not to recall a number of facts, but to mobilize and apply those facts or knowledge in a relevant context to solve new problems. So the learning activities should aid discussion or encourage ways of comparing and contrasting given resources. Instead of teaching the pathophysiology of nausea and vomiting, the concept map is designed how to approach a patient with vomiting and encourage you to mobilize, interpret, and efficiently manage knowledge in a clinical context with the purpose of solving clinical problems. By this way, the knowledge of the physiology of nausea and vomiting is integrated into more complex knowledge schemas. A well-taken history with good differentials will be vital to guide the necessary investigations for diagnosis. When you take history, you must include three things. Causes of the symptom, details of the symptom, and effect of the symptom to your patient. 
sometimes multiple processes can be going on at the same time. So please be careful to double check to identify and pick up life threatening causes. This concludes the topic. I hope this can aid you in assessment of patients presenting with nausea and vomiting. Good luck with your studies.